Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you can all hear me uh, and see me at the moment. Um, my name is Ben Channer. Uh, I'm a member of the Three Hair Court Insolvency Team, um, and I would like to welcome you to our July Insolvency uh, webinar, um, which I will be um, giving you and taking you through the topic of uh, the effect of insolvency on contractual obligations. Um, like many areas of insolvency law, um, it's been affected quite greatly uh, by recent events, um, led by obviously the response um, to COVID that the government have set out in Corporate Insolvency uh, and Governance Act, which, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, came into force on the 26th of June. Um, before I get going and, and share my screen and some slides with you, um, if anybody has any issues in terms of uh, IT or um, connectivity, then please raise either a, a, a hand or um, an issue in the Q&A or message. Um, we have Leanne, our marketing manager, um, on uh, who can hopefully assist. She's on the Three Hair Court admin. Um, so if you message her, then I'm sure we can, we can sort out any issues. So let me see if I can. Start by showing you my slides. So as I say, the, the issues that I would like to uh, explore with you today, the effects of insolvency on contractual um, obligations, uh, in terms of uh, an overview uh, as to the contents, then I'll be setting out the, the position that we had until quite recently prior to um, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act. I think I'll move away from that rather uncatchy title and just call it the Act. Um, so setting out a general overview as to the position we were in prior to that then exploring the, the changes that have been brought about um, as a result of, of the act and, and how we got there. Um, and then a brief, I think, comparison with, with other jurisdictions as to how their insolvency regimes uh, compare to what we had and then what we now have. Um, and then if time allows, then um, I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Perhaps if you could either message me directly or um, set out in the uh, Q&A section uh, any questions then hopefully um, I'll be able to answer some of those if time doesn't allow then uh, I'll obviously get back to you uh, directly um, probably by email. Um, let's then look at uh, the general overview of insolvency um, effects on contractual obligations. Um, now, first of all, it's useful to point out, there's, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll, we'll all probably be well aware, that there's no common law right for a party uh, to terminate a contract in the event uh, that the other party to the contract becomes insolvent or faces any sort of other um, types of financial difficulty. Um, the entitlement to terminate or, um, in actual fact, to rely on, on anything um, in the contract um, as a result of insolvency must be expressly uh, provided for it uh, in the contract and interpreting that is then a matter uh, of contractual construction. Um, but I imagine we're all very familiar um, with what are generally termed ipso facto clauses. Um, if like me you didn't study Latin at school um, ipso facto um, translates quite literally uh, to by that very fact. So generally in a um, contractual setting, uh, an ipso facto clause will allow termination of, of the contract and any obligations um, dependent upon it um, as a result of one or either of the parties uh, entering into insolvency or being affected um, by an insolvency event. Um, as I say, you frequently come across these uh, terms. They're often set out in general boilerplate fashion towards the end of a, uh, of a contract. Um, and they often reference 
what I've just mentioned, insolvency events are usually very widely uh, drafted um, to catch any and, and all events that can be anticipated uh, that may arise upon a company entering into financial difficulty. Um, often that will be uh, before the formal insolvency process begins, such as presentation of winding up petitions um, or petitions being issued, uh, notice of intention to, to appoint administrators um, when that's filed, um, and then also obviously more generally um, in relation to liquidation at winding up um, or entering into uh, restructuring processes, um, such as moratorium, CBAs, uh, or administration. So, as I say, I'm sure we're all well aware with the general insolvency provisions that we see uh, in, in contracts. The, the reason for these clauses is, is really fairly obvious. It's to um, give a protection to uh, the supplier, who's often likely to be an unsecured service provider, um, and gives them the ability to terminate contractual obligations in respect of which they're unlikely to be paid because of the financial difficulties encountered by um, the, the other party to the contract. Uh, continuing to supply or provide services to a paying party um, who is insolvent or is likely to become insolvent puts the unsecured creditor or the service provider at risk of receiving only pennies in the pound for any debt owed to it at the close of the insolvency process. So again, as I say, it's, it's fairly obvious why um, ipso facto uh, clauses in contracts uh, are, are put there in the first place. Um, and equally, if the paying party commits a breach of contract, the right to sue for the breach uh, is likely to be fairly uh, worthless, uh, given that any damages awarded are likely to rank uh, in the priority process as an unsecured claim. Um, also, uh, if the supplier um, supplying party stops supplying out of a, a concern for being paid, concern as amounting debt, um, they may not be paid, they may well find themselves uh, in breach of the contract and liable to pay damages in full. Um, the benefit to a party uh, of being able to terminate a contract uh, upon um, an insolvency event uh, can, of course, though, and this will lead us on to the uh, general consideration of the provisions of, of the Act and the, the underlying um, relevance of it, um, they can come into conflict with general policies aimed at rescuing companies, uh, which will uh, obviously be difficult if not impossible uh, if services are withdrawn from it. Um, and reliance on it so facto uh, clauses often lead to problems, um, as no doubt you'll be aware, for administrators and liquidators uh, when their intention is to continue trading the business or facilitating a rescue because of a threat to often business critical uh, contracts. So a uh, slight bit of scene setting as to where we were um, prior to the act coming into force. There were some restrictions on the ability for a party to rely on ipso facto clauses uh, prior to the, the very recent act. We can see those in the Insolvency Act itself uh, sections 233, 233A. Um, these relate, as I've set out there, um, to insolvency re related terms of contracts, um, i.e. in an ipso facto clause, ceasing to have a, uh, an effect in relation to the supply of gas, water and electricity. So very um, basic and crucial uh, utilities. Um, that being the case when a company enters into administration, receives appointed moratorium, or voluntary agreement takes effect. Um, so there was that exclusion um, already. The ongoing supply was paid uh, as a cost of the estate um, and the supplier could not demand payment of arrears as a condition of ongoing supply, uh, but could request a personal guarantee from the office holder. So I think we, we can envisage fairly clearly the scenario that, that led to the need for those, um, uh, for those provisions. Um, if a company got into difficulty, had arrears in respect of its utilities, its, its gas uh, payments, for instance, um, 
it's a, a fairly an enviable situation for the company and administrators or liquidators to be in um, if the utility company um, terminates the contract for, for breach uh, and says we'll only reconnect if arrears are paid. Um, first of all, there, there may not be the money um, in order to pay any arrears, um, but even if there were, it may be that what is actually required by the, the office holders at the time um, is a standstill agreement to be able to restructure uh, without outgoings um, uh, in relation to, to arrears. So the Insolvency Act there um, setting out some uh, degree of um, exclusion in relation to so facto clauses uh, for what, what it terms as protection uh, of essential goods and services. Um, that's obviously the world in 1986 or, or thereabouts as to what was important for a business. As time has moved on, um, fairly obviously, uh, there was a need, uh, one might have thought, for the expansion of that. In 2015, the Insolvency uh, Protection of Essential Supplies orders, uh, Order um, developed that and extended what amounted uh, to a uh, essential supply um, effectively to the provision of IT services and, and those technologies that we're all now uh, very dependent on, um, as if we weren't before, but I think particularly given working in lockdown, um, the, the relevance and the importance of these is pretty obvious. So there was the extension um, to contracts concerning point of sale terminals, uh, computer hardware, software, uh, information, advice and technical assistance in connection with the use of IT, uh, data storage and website hosting, all factors which um, I suppose now largely rank uh, as important, if not uh, more important than the, the, the provision of basic utilities. Now, we're all uh, aware, obviously, that um, in, in general terms, what the Act has done uh, has extended by quite a significant way the prohibitions on ipso facto clauses. Um, but it didn't, it hasn't come out of the blue. We can see, and I've set out there, that really what we now see in the Act um, had its um, its beginnings in prior considerations and consultations by the government. Um, in, in 2018, uh, the government published its response to its review of the corporate insolvency framework um, and also its consultation on insolvency and corporate governance uh, 2017. And, and much of the suggestions in that uh, have now made their way into the Act. So I think we can probably see that... Uh, the act brought about by COVID has, has been a catalyst, but perhaps not the not, not the cause of a change um, in approach of, of ipso facto clauses and their prohibition. But nonetheless, the act, um, well, the act and what was thought to be um, desirable to implement prior to that, um, as a result of the consultations, um, was, was considered that instead of expanding the concept of essential services and supplies to continually just adding um, to the gas, electricity, IT, um, there was a su suggestion of, of effectively a, a blanket prohibition uh, of ipso facto clauses, um, but subject to specific exemptions uh, such as contracts for financial services, and we'll go through those in, in some detail. Um, in, in terms of general uh, policy, the question I suppose has to be asked, um, to what extent uh, is prohibition of ipso facto clauses uh, an interference, and if it is an interference, which ultimately it is, to what extent is that reasonable with freedom of contract? Um, and we've obviously heard uh, a, a great deal um, about the current climate that we are um, encouraged to be in in relation to administrations and the rescue culture um, and, and I think we can see the fairly obviously from 2016 consultations um, and the published reports uh, that the the driving force even then as I say is we, we we hear a lot about it now but all this was aimed at developing a rescue culture uh, and motivated um, 
partly, I think quite significantly, by either catching up or adopting and not being left out um, by approaches um, in relation to ipso facto clauses and their uh, exclusions that were being used in jurisdictions um, elsewhere with well-regarded insolvency regimes. Um, we'll, we'll look at these, as I said, briefly, but it's, it's obviously the, the US, EU, um, and we'll also look at Australia and Singapore. Coming on then to the perhaps the the the, the meat of the the webinar, um, under the Act, what is the what is the position? Well, Section fourteen of the Act um, inserts into the Insolvency Act uh, Section two three three B, the protection of supplies and services. Now, this is a huge extension of the insolvency um, processes which ipso facto provisions will apply to. Um, is the first point. Um, in terms of when they will be triggered, it will also be relevant um, uh, when a company enters into a new moratorium process or, or when the court uh, makes an order convening a meeting of creditors uh, to consider the approval of restructuring plan. It doesn't cover schemes of arrangement, um, but even so, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite obvious uh, that underlining this is, is a widening of the insolvency processes uh, which ipso facto provisions um, will apply to. The ability of the supplier to require the office holder to give a personal guarantee uh, is removed. Um, clearly good news in respect of um, the personal liabilities of, of office holders carrying out their duties. Um, and the supplies, the, the ongoing supplies and the cost of them will be expenses of the insolvent estate in administration, uh, liquidation, CVA, or administrative re uh, receivership. Um, in, in the case of a company that goes into the moratorium, uh, there'll be moratorium debt, uh, which the company will have to pay, um, or the monitor is required to terminate the um, moratorium. In, importantly, particularly in relation to um, the ongoing success of restructuring a company um, in financial difficulty, the arrears prior to insolvency, the, the insolvency process um, are not payable uh, by the office holder uh, or the, the company. Um, now the purpose of this um, in terms of policy, I think it's perhaps relatively unsurprising, it's, it's an aim to give an insolvent company a greater chance of, of rescue or survival um, as a going concern by enabling it to, to, to trade um, with the caveat though, um, that it can pay for supplies on an ongoing basis. So it, it extends this um, notion of uh, rescue culture, giving it some breathing space um, without the uh, termination of contracts uh, that are crucial uh, potentially for um, it, its ongoing survival. Section 14 of the Act, um, as it amends Section 233B of the Insolvency Act, uh, it extends the services, the contracts uh, to which ipso facto clauses will, will not be effective uh, as well. Um, as I say there, and the second bullet point, where a provision of a contract uh, for the supply of goods and services uh, would terminate uh, or any other thing would take place because the company becomes subject to the relevant insolvency pr procedure, uh, that provision ceases to have effect when the company goes into the relevant insolvency process. So uh, not exactly um, uh, poetic, um, but the wording of the act there um, is this blanket um, uh, imposition of prohibitions on, um, uh, on ipso facto uh, clauses. Termination is only possible with the consent of the office holder uh, or the company um, or when the court considers that the supplier will suffer what's termed hardship. Um, so again, fairly uh, rigorous approach, um, fairly unrelenting uh, in relation to the prohibition uh, the blanket prohibition on ipso facto clauses, or, or so it would seem thus far. Um, I think what's also worth 
remembering um, in relation to, particularly from a, a supplier's point of view, uh, is that if the supplier was entitled to terminate uh, the contract by reason of an event occurring prior to the commencement of the insolvency process, um, and, they, and they didn't for, for whatever reason, then that entitlement um, can't be exercised subsequently during the insolvency process. It's, it, it's then lost. Um, and I think it's also, um, whilst considering the, the wide ambit of the provision, it's worth mentioning that um, in, in second bullet point there, which is taken from the Act, uh, it's, it's not only um, a clause that would enable uh, a party to terminate, but it's also, or, or any other thing. So a, a, a party um, can't seek to take advantage of an insolvent company by um, seeking to alter terms, increasing uh, prices or anything of that nature. A couple of practical points there that, uh, that it occurs to me are worth uh, considering um, as a result of those, that initial consideration uh, of uh, the, the Act. Um, contractual obligations to supply um, from this fairly obviously continue. Um, that's the, the purpose of it. Uh, so office holders will need to review, um, it seems to me, the, the key supply arrangements and agreements um, quite early on and prior to uh, their appointment, probably, as part of their preparations. Um, because then they're going to be in a position to um, be ready to contact suppliers immediately on their appointment um, if they don't want the ongoing uh, supply. Um, if that's going to be a burden, um, then it seems sensible to try and uh, work out a way in which that can be alleviated as, as soon as possible. Um, and, and that invariably is going to be the opening of a, of a conversation uh, with suppliers, um, with trying to, uh, with, with the minds to trying to agree um, a, a termination. I think it then follows that this should help ideally to avoid arguments um, that the continuation of a supply uh, would be payable as an expense of the insolvent estate. Um, so, so again, perhaps making everybody's life easier and, and clearer in terms of ongoing obligations and payments for them. Um, and that's particularly important to um, consider, it, it occurs to me, by the um, office holders, because any obligation to pay ongoing um, supply fees uh, under a contract uh, is a is a high priority or top priority as, I, as I've put there um, to the extent that it's above the office holders fee which um, shows really that the, the process now I think needs to be uh, forward loaded quite significantly to to get a, um, a really firm handle uh, on contractual obligations now I've described the ipso facto clauses under the Act is this reversal in approach um, from what we previously had uh, to a blanket prohibition on ipso facto clauses. Um, but as we'll go through now, these are subject to exceptionally wide exclusions uh, of, of certain types of contracts uh, and also in relation to certain types of uh, supply contracts uh, and suppliers. So covering two bases of, of exclusions. Dealing first then with the exempt supplier type, um, as I say, these are very wide sweeping measures, um, largely related to insurance and bank related entities uh, set out there. It's in insurers, banks, investment banks, investment firms, payment institutions, operators of payment systems, recognized investment exchanges or clearing houses, securitization companies uh, and, and overseas activities. Um, so fairly broad their uh, exclusions on financial services. Um, the, the last point, overseas activities, is um, I think worth pointing out because where the company or supplier has done things overseas, um, which if they were done in the UK, uh, would cause the exemptions to apply. They're, they're also caught within the within the exemption. If you actually look at the Act, um, the services and the contract types 
of insurers, banks, investment banks, are defined by way of definition to the initial act. Um, so whether it's the, the Companies Act or um, Financial Services Act or, or whatever it is, uh, then if, say, for instance, a, um, a supplier was um, uh, was based in Germany, a German bank, then um, because they carry out uh, functions uh, as uh, the same as those set out um, within the wide exclusions, it's a, it's a bank or it's an insurer, um, simply by fact of it being overseas uh, makes no difference and it'll still be called uh, within the exclusion. In relation to the exempt contracts, um, these are all set out in Schedule 12 uh, of, of the Act, which is, is, is pretty lengthy, um, but they're all, again, largely contracts to do with the provision of financial services. Um, lending, factoring, financing, commercial transactions and, and leasing, uh, as, as well as securities uh, and, and really a, a whole list of financial issues, contracts, including purchasing of loans, securities, options, repurchasing uh, or future or forwards contracts. There's also a lot of reference within the, the Act to exclusions of commodities contracts which oddly isn't actually defined within the Act, but it's said to include contracts that are set out there at some length and detail. Uh, the contracts including those for the purchase sale uh, or loan of a commodity, again, doesn't define commodity, but whatever that is, you can't purchase, sale or loan it, um, or a group or index of commodities for future delivery, uh, an option on a commodity or group or index of commodities repurchase. As you can see, I won't bore you by reading it all out, um, but it goes down in some detail. Um, you can see it includes swap agreements, options in relation to index, uh, interest rates, um, the foreign exchange agreements, currency, equities. So exceptionally wide ranging um, types of contracts that fall um, within the exemptions of the Act. As I said, Commodities aren't defined, but tucked away at the bottom of, of the schedule, we're reminded that commodities uh, include uh, units recognised for compliance with EU directives on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, uh, relating to emissions under the climate change and renewable obligation certificates. Um, I'm, I'm sure there may well be case law at, at some point to precisely nail down what is meant by commodities and what isn't um, but, but I think we'll just have to wait and see. In general then um, it seems to me and I think fairly obviously that what we have here under the Act in relation to contractual obligations um, and ipso facto clauses um, is a significant widening on the prohibition to, to terminate a contract uh, by reason of insolvency um, on the face of it, for all supply agreements, so a very uh, about-face change in relation to where the emphasis is, is put, um, exclusions um, of blanket, uh, uh, on a blanket ban, um, but with very large within that exceptions, uh, particularly for financial contracts. And I think the, that the reasoning for that is, is pretty clear, so that the... Um, uh, a, a lender, bank, insurer doesn't have an ongoing obligation to, to lend. So if, if you're um, a bank, uh, a lender, insurance company, or whatever it is, financial services uh, provider, then you're likely, if you want to, to be caught within the, um, the exclusion to the general blanket ipso facto um, prohibitions set out in the Act. Uh, but for many other uh, suppliers, fairly obviously, the um, vast majority I would suspect, um, they are at first blush going to be um, caught within ipso facto prohibitions, um, which is going to mean um, that they're not able to terminate an agreement upon insolvency or insolvency event uh, occurring um, with their other contracting party. So what then are the options available to suppliers if they do want to terminate 
Well, I think, first of all, it's probably not a, a legal issue, um, but it's a matter of uh, discussions with the office holder, um, the office holder and supplier for their consent to terminate, or if not terminate, then to arrive at a workable solution. Um, it, as I said earlier, I think it was very much um, an indirect, I suspect, um, consequence of all this is, is the front loading of, of work and consideration um, to hopefully try and avoid um, litigation or further issues uh, down the line. But if it's not possible for uh, the consent of the office holder to be obtained um, or a workable solution isn't arrived at between the supplier and the office holder, um, the, the Act does provide um, for an application to be um, made to the court. Um, that is on the basis that the supplier company is going to face hardship. Now, hardship isn't a, uh, a term we're, we're overly, overly familiar, I don't think, in English insolvency uh, law. So again, I can see um, cases developing, and I think we'll have to wait and see as to how uh, th this approach and the interpretation of, of hardship develops. Um, but I think invariably it's going to be a relatively high hurdle. Um, and as we've seen with some cases that have come out in relation to the Act and um, approaches of, to administration relatively recently, I think the court's likely to have regard to the, the underlying purposes of, of the Act. Um, and, and that is, as I say, to, to promote this rescue culture um, to help companies through distress and um, potentially to obtain, if, if necessary, well, um, if, if rescue is not possible, the, the best result for, for creditors. Um, it's going to be, I think, considered fairly contrary to those intentions if in allowing a, um, a company to be rescued is to the detriment of another company who's supplying them uh, with with services. So I think relevant, um, it's going to be relevant um, if an obligation to supply would would then put the supplier themselves in difficulty. It hardly seems um, any point um, in saving one company to the detriment of, of another in, in terms of uh, overall policy. You can perhaps see that I think um, developing as, as an argument if there are if, if unpaid arrears uh, are needed um, by the supplier in order to carry on supplying an insolvent uh, company. Whilst these are these are permanent changes, they um, they're all set out within the Act, um, and it. Um, becomes the forefront, or forefront of uh, our insolvency uh, regime, there is an element of a temporary measure, and that's the temporary uh, exemption for small suppliers. Um, this is an exemption um, for uh, a, a, only a month um, from the date of the uh, Act coming into force, so that's the 26th of June. Um, so we don't really have uh, long for this uh, exception to run. Um, but even then, it's not a, it's not a blanket um, exemption for small supplies. They have to, uh, any supplier seeking to rely on the temporary exemption uh, has to um, meet one of, uh, sorry, two of three um, relevant factors. It's a turnover uh, of below 10.2 million, uh, balance sheet loss, uh, sorry, balance sheet uh, totaling less than 5.1 million. Um, and no fewer, uh, no more than 50 uh, employees. So that's the general, um, uh, those are the, the, the matters that need to be uh, satisfied if a small supplier is, is looking to um, avail itself uh, of, of the exemption. But um, as I say, we are rapidly approaching the, the end of that uh, period. So um, it'd be interesting to see whether any suppliers actually, uh, uh, whether that has any relevance. Some more practical 
point um, in relation to uh, the act that, that occurred to me. Um, and that's that I think the act now fairly undoubtedly gives office holders the, the upper hand, um, as it were, uh, whereas previously it'd been the other way round with important suppliers able effectively to demand increased prices or, or payment of arrears uh, in return for continued um, supply uh, of, of services or, or goods. So I'm sure um, for the, the office holders or people um, in the webinar that uh, have, have frequent dealings with, with office holders, then um, perhaps there's a degree of uh, either rebalancing or, or more power uh, given to them under the Act. Um, and I think because of that, it changes the dynamic, or it's likely to change the dynamic uh, of, of conversations between office holders um, and suppliers. I think we, we would hope that would be more constructively, um, but it, it, I, again, I think it comes back to a, to a front loading um, of getting things in order at an early stage so that if there's a need to um, terminate a uh, contract, then that can be done by way of a uh, constructive dialogue. But, but having said that, I think there's also the, the potential for um, almost the opposite. I think suppliers are likely now to consider termination provisions uh, and relevant triggers in contracts as to termination or variation of terms quite a lot earlier and, and in more detail so that they're not caught by the um, blanket ipso facto prohibitions if the company they're contracting with um, faces subsequent financial difficulty. Um, it, it may also be um, that suppliers um, look at beefing up their uh, clauses in contracts so that termination can um, for um, default of payment um, be enacted on or, or acted on much sooner. As I say there, I think it's, it's likely we, we may well see um, a little more comprehensive uh, termination clauses. Let's have a look then now at a, a brief overview of um, comparison with, with other jurisdictions. Um, and I think we can, even before we look at these in any detail, it's fairly obvious that the Act um, allows us, in a sense, to catch up with, or at least be on a similar par um, with other leading um, insolvency regimes uh, around the world. And I think even back at the consultation, consulta consultation stage, um, uh, 2016, 17 and 18, I think the government certainly had an eye on bringing um, our, our regime into line, um, potentially to, to maintain a competitive advantage um, with other leading jurisdictions. So the EU um, position this is from the Restructuring and Second Chance Directive, which was adopted uh, in June 2019. It's obviously around the, uh, uh, the, the, the time of, of Brexit. Um, prior to this, the, the UK was obviously um, fairly involved in, in discussions. Um, but the preamble, again, sets out what the directive sought to achieve. Uh, the debtor would also benefit from a more general protection against ipso facto clauses, so that suppliers with contractual rights to terminate the supply contract solely based on the insolvency will not be able to invoke such rights. Um, so, again, seems to me fairly um, in line with what we're, we're becoming increasingly familiar with uh, by, by way of a, an approach to uh, develop a rescue culture. That's particularly um, apparent in the US, the chapter 11 um, is a, again a pretty tight blanket uh, ban, uh, as it were, prohibition on, on ipso facto clauses, notwithstanding provision in any executory contract or an expired lease. Uh, an executory contract or an expired lease of the debtor may not be terminated or modified uh, and any right or obligation under such contract or lease uh, may not be terminated or modified uh, at any time. Um, I, I won't read the rest. I think you, you, you get the gist. The Americans got a fairly um, 
fairly tight, rigid system in relation to the um, uh, prohibition of ipso facto clauses. It's a similar um, situation in Australia. Um, the Treasury Laws Amendment uh, Act uh, was in, it's been in force since 1st of July 2018. I don't think there's been a huge amount of litigation or clarification. Um, it's, it's fairly similar and broadly in line uh, with the Act. Um, ipso facto clauses uh, are not to have effect. Um, and then again, similar to how the Act sets it out, subject to over 60 exclusions of specific financial contracts. Um, I think a, a cursory glance at, at the Australian Act shows that the um, financial contracts they refer to are detailed in quite a, a high degree of um, uh, uh, detail and specifics. So I, I think um, it'd be interesting to know to what extent there's been wiggle room in effect um, because of how specific the, uh, the Australian Act is, is drafted. Um, in Canada, they introduced, uh, or I think amendments to the Companies Creditors Arrangement Act, um, again, with very wide ranging exceptions. Uh, interestingly, the approach taken in Canada um, in relation to uh, suppliers that still wanted to terminate, um, the, the wording, the language used in uh, the Companies Creditors Arrangement Act so the supplier can terminate if faced with uh, quote significant financial hardship. So it adds a little more um, to, to, to hardship. We obviously simply have hardship. Um, but with that, there's a need, I think in Canada, uh, for any significant financial hardship to be, to be demonstrated by way of being quantitative. So objectively, they, they would have to show, any supplier uh, would have to show uh, the, well, the, the, the need to put a figure on it, I think, in, in general terms. Um, so if they're able to point to a specific figure, this is our loss, uh, this is the detriment that we will suffer um, if we're not able to terminate, um, and, and that's what they would have to take to, uh, to, to the court. Um, finally then, uh, Singapore. Um, amendments to the Companies Act uh, in 2017 were made. This is modelled on the Canadian legislation, so it's obviously got some uh, fans around the world. Um, and I think, again, generally demonstrates the, the way that leading um, insolvency regimes, um, the approaches that they've taken and, and which ours now um, uh, falls in line with. But as I say, that's modelled on Canadian legislation, it's not yet in force. Um, but again, it'll be interesting to see how, how things develop uh, in relation to that. I think that whistle-stop tour uh, takes us through uh, everything with that um, comparison with, with other jurisdictions. Um, Take-home points, I think, that, that occur to me that I've uh, set out uh, are that I think the, the act what was effectively a long time coming. Um, I think it's so facto um, provisions that was writing on the wall um, has, has been there for, for some time, subject to what we have uh, now with these very wide exceptions. Um, and, and it brings us into line um, with other leading uh, insolvency jurisdictions. Um, and it also um, demonstrates that the, the thrust of the act being um, rescue, rescue, rescue. Um, and, and go some way in putting the power in the hands of um, uh, uh, um, companies and uh, rescue. Um, now, I'm going to attempt to see uh, if I can answer some questions. If, if not, I may well um, have to uh, email. Um, Lord Taylor asks, does the blanket prohibition of effective clauses cover both an employer's right um, and or contractor's right to terminate? Well, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a blanket. So it's anything, um, it, it's anything set out in, in a contract that provides for a termination uh, clause. So um, I hope that answers the, the, the question, but it's, it is, I think, as it sort of suggests, it's a, 
it's a blanket prohibition. Um, so it'll cover, uh, it'll, it'll effectively cover, cover anything. Again, in relation, somebody asked, I think Laura asked also in relation to JCT um, suite of building contracts, it, it, unless they can be somehow squeezed within the, the, the exceptions, and I think it, it's likely that they're going to be um, caught within the blanket prohibition. Uh, it's very wide ranging. The, the exceptions um, are uh, heavily um, biased or focused on financial services and financial um, lenders and providers. Um, so, if, if a JCT contract can be can be um, crept in under there, then I think that there may be room. But uh, but it really depends, I think, on on in persuading either the court, if necessary, or um, the the other party to the contract that it's uh, that it falls to be exempt. Uh, Mark Lim, I think, final final question. If the office holder is not agreeing to release, to what extent is it open to a supplier to work up and stairs anticipatory? Um, sorry, Mark, I think I've uh, lost your question, but I, I found it again. To what extent is it open to a supplier to work up instead anticipatory um, repudiatory breach argument to terminate the contract in the common law? Um, the provisions presumably don't affect rights in the common law. Um, I think the answer to that, Mark, is I think that's probably right. Um, the the act, as I said at the beginning, there's, there's no um, common law uh, right to terminate. It's a matter of contractual interpretation uh, subject to any statutory um, exceptions. So that that being the case, um, if there is a common law right to terminate, um, I think you're referring there to the anticipatory uh, breach, a uh, repudiatory breach, then um, I think there's, there's, a, there's an arguable case to that. Um, I think it goes back to what I was saying in relation to um, there's likely to be an increase, I think, of suppliers um, padding out other terms of, of their uh, agreements so that they're able to um, in, invoke termination clauses a, a, a lot sooner so they don't get caught by the um, ipso facto provisions once an insolvency event is, is triggered. So I think there's going to be, um, um, I, I can certainly see an argument that there have been other breaches amounting to repudiation of the contract um, being run by suppliers who don't want um, to leave it too late in effect to um, uh, before insolvency kicks in. Um, so that brings us, I think, uh, to the end of uh, my webinar. Um, I'd be I'm going to stop showing my screen. Um, I hope that's in some way been uh, useful, insightful as, a, as an overview as to the current situation um, that we're in post the, the act um, coming into force um, and quite significantly altering um, the effects of insolvency on contractual obligations. Um, if anyone has any uh, questions arising from that, I'd be more than happy uh, to um, uh, answer them, get back to you by email. Um, but thank you very much for taking part and listening to this uh, webinar. Um, these are monthly webinars, um, but it's obviously August um, next month. We'll be uh, taking a break, but back uh, uh, in September. So I hope you can join us uh, for our September webinar. Um, and in the meantime, I hope you all have, uh, to what extent we can now, um, have a very enjoyable uh, summer. Thank you very much.